Hello, everybody, and welcome to another interview with the artist. And today I am very excited. Uh, it is the man himself, Darren Latham, is on the show. Designer for GW, excellent miniature painter, uh, just all around hero in the community, and one of my personal favorite uh, painters of all time. How you doing, sir? I'm good. Thanks, Vince. That's quite an introduction. <laughs> You've you've more than earned it, I think. the The amount of hours you've put in, you've earned at least that uh, that introduction, my friend. So and hopefully, it doesn't show on my you know on my face the hours I've put in. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a pleasure to come on. I'd say it's it's nice. I've say I've been watching the show for quite a while now, so it's nice to finally finally be asked, you know, uh, to come on. So it was good. So well, you know, we had to we had to build up, right? I had to, I had to convince <laughs> you first. That's what it was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, it's good. Thank you. So today we're going to talk a lot about miniature painting. We're going to talk about your journey as an artist. That's what we're here for. Uh, and we're just going to kind of move through, uh, you know, what you what drew you to painting, what you like, what you're still painting, what you enjoy. We'll probably talk a little bit about the tutorials and stuff since you've gotten into to teaching on YouTube and all that kind of thing. And yeah. uh, and and you know your your the journey that you're on, your painting journey. All right. Yeah. Sure. Great. So, I mean, let's start at the beginning, right? That's where we always start. So, this is the the this is what I want to understand. Where did young Darren first encounter? Uh, I assume, by the way, you as a child looked exactly like you now. My image of you is like exactly <laughs> the same, just like two feet shorter, basically, right? That's it, exactly the same, no different. <laughs> <laughs> Only with less energy. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. So where did you first uh, encounter miniature painting, miniatures? Like, how did you first decide to say, I would like to do this weird hobby we all do, which is pick up a paintbrush, get some miniature paint, and put it onto a tiny plastic or metal man? Yeah. So it's, it's a similar story to most people. I mean, I, I watched Gareth's interview, so his story was so similar to mine. It was almost a copy-paste. Uh, I've got an older brother, Dave, who's two years older than me. So he was always into sort of fantasy and stuff like that. We, we read the fighting fantasy books and things when we were younger. So there was a group of him and his friends at school that went into a classroom at lunch times and messed around with that sort of stuff and maybe played some Dungeons and Dragons and things. And then one day he bought home a White Dwarf magazine and uh, and I looked at it straight away and I just knew that whatever was in there was for me. I think it was the back of the White Dwarf that had one of the battle shots on. Okay. The Blood Angels and Eldar and it was all painted and I, I just, the, the first thing that really struck me was that, that, that these miniatures were painted as well, that you didn't buy them colored, you know, right. you can do with lots of toys and things. And I was like, and I was always being quite creative, always in, into my art, you know, so I'd always be drawing and things. So it was, um, it was just, it just struck me that it was really interesting. So, and then he started getting into it more and I sort of pushed into the group a little bit. I was like the little, you know, the, the young one out of the whole group because they were all two years older. Okay, gotcha. And, and I was trying to keep up with the rules and things because we were playing a few games by that point. And I was always more interested in the painting. So I, I'd just be painting, painting single figures and things. And like I said, we really started with Hero Quest and Space Crusade, just like many people. Yeah, you know, sure. About our age, it was sort of it was the gateway, you know. And then it, then it went into Warhammer Fantasy Battles, and then Rogue Trader, 40k, and then I saw a Space Marine, and then. That was it then. Gotcha. <laughs> so it was game over by that point. Um, so yeah, but it was always been the painting, and it was looking through the White Dwarf magazines because then we had the Ever Metal pages, yep. and they just show um, just you know a gallery of awesomely painted models, uh, you know, from the studio guys and from anybody else, and it was just there was no rhyme or reason to it. It was just a space room next to another different type of model or next to an elf, and it was just they were just awesome. I just remember not being interested in any of the words and just looking at those pictures for hours and hours and hours. I mean, to the point where, you know, I got a little collection of paints and then it was, I started sticking those on the wall. Uh, you know, most kids would have posters of other things, bands they like and stuff on the wall. I sure. Mine were pictures of miniatures that, uh, that were painted by the, 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 the uh, their Never Metal team and the studio guys. And I just have them around for inspiration. Anyway. I'm rambling now anyway, so that's, that's how it's... You're not at all. No, that's <laughs> fascinating. 
Uh, like, I love the idea of you over your, in your, in your childhood bedroom, having these posters where everybody else has their, their tiger beat posters. You've got the heavy metal painter pictures. On the it podcast. was, it was, it was just pictures. I remember there was a gallery of Eldar ones. I, I cut them out of Black Dwarf and just put them on the wall. And it, they, they were there. I mean, not, I did, I did it at the time just because I loved them. But right. now I realized that it was inspiration. Right. You know, but, but then I didn't realize what I was doing. I was just these are so cool they belong on the wall you know i had my star wars posters up and everything else and then i had those and yeah but now it's like yeah they i think they, they served as for inspiration for me so nice. yeah, it was cool nice yeah. so you said you were always creative always into art now at the yeah. same time were you you know so you you get into this are you taking any art classes in school stuff like that like did you did you do any formal you know for well let's call it quote unquote formal art training at the same time uh, yeah, well, at school you have choices, you know, uh, subject choices at a certain point. So I obviously chose art because it was what, one of the things I excelled in and one of the things I was passionate about. And then I did, then I went to art college as well for two okay. years. And then I um, went out to do study fine art at university for a little while. And then I joined Games Workshop from that. So it was, uh, it was something that I, I was, it was the thing I was best at and the thing I cared most about. <laughs> so it just oh, made gotcha. sense. I mean, originally it was, okay, I'm going to go to university. Uh, and then, you know, uh, career in art isn't always easy to find. So my plan was to become an art teacher because sure. you know, hopefully there'd be a job there. And then uh, <clears throat> and Games Workshop sort of, I found my way into Games Workshop from there really. So that was my journey. So it was art, art education, and then that led into a part-time job at Games Workshop to support the education. And yep. then that led into full-time work at Games Workshop. So it kind of flowed quite nicely. There was a horrific year out, which I had after school. I thought, okay, I'm 16. I can I can do anything. Now. And then realized that the world isn't such a, a, great, a great place at that age. And uh, I was like, I need to go back to college and do what I need to do. So Gotcha. Yeah. All right. That's pretty much it. No, that's, I mean, it, it is an interesting arc because... So many miniature painters I talk to, you know, first of all, there ends up like one of the most common things that happens is what I call the the gap years, yeah. right? Because it ends up being that, well, uh, you know, I was playing with the toy soldiers and then I discovered that there were girls and yeah. that and then and I, you know, sort of had the idea that I that that one would cancel out the other, <laughs> the matter and antimatter, right? Yeah. And and it sounds like you had a much more uh even progression where you were you were still engaged in art that whole time regardless. And so it's kind of yeah. it's fascinating that you you never you never left the artistic pursuits. No, I think yeah, it was always the creativity was always there bubbling underneath, but I think I did drop out of miniatures for a little while and then found them again, you know, when you find them in your bedroom again, you're like, "Oh, I remember these." So, pick them up again and then before before I left, I thought, you know, you look back and you think, oh, I'm a great miniature painter. You know, you think it's amazing. And then right, sure. I, I tried to do some painting again after a little break and realized how that I couldn't even, you know, see the model or hold the brush properly again. And that sort of gave me, sort of spurred me on to, to get back into it and try and improve from where I left off. So, uh, but yeah, it's funny when you look back at your old paint jobs and at the time you think, I'm going to win a Slayer Sword with this. And then you look back, uh, you look at it, now and you're like what was i thinking right sure because <laughs> in your mind it's completely different so it was, it was that kind of thing so it, it's a wonderful thing our brains do in smoothing out the 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 <laughs> sort of uh the edges of history right of exactly. our own work yeah absolutely it's um, nice to back there, so. <laughs> so when you when you started miniature painting and you and then you continue on were you also playing at the same time or was your focus always in the painting part more than the playing part? Uh, I tried to play um, I, because I was painting and I, I wanted painted miniatures. I didn't get to play many big games. I always, I always tried to join in with the group as it were, you know, the guys sure. at school and things. Um, but it was always, uh, I played a lot of uh, Blood Bowl, a lot of Blood Bowl, because you only needed like 11 or 12 models. Right. And I actually love Blood Bowl, uh, but it hates me, unfortunately. <laughs> so, and uh, I played uh, played a lot of Necromunda, a bit of more, you know, the smaller games, the games where you, you didn't need as many models at the time. Uh, and then I think I, I joined in with the 40K and the Warhammer as I could, but it was generally just as uh, a little bit. But it was only later on. Uh, when when I was working in games workshop retail stores, it was like, okay, I need to have a 40k army, a Warhammer army, and I have to play these games. I've got to get involved. You know, it was 
and then painting armies in this store and things. So it was then that I played the bigger games. But my 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 entry was like board games, hero quest, things like that, and then it, the smaller games, and it sort of gradually grew uh, from that. Really, but yeah, I've always been. If I'm going to paint a model, I'll always do it to the best I can. So I never really got armies done, you know. So uh, and then my my recent army, my space moon army, uh, I really had to be strict with myself with. Um, you know the method, and you know, and how to get them done in time, and and actually have something at the end of it to play with as well. So, and I'm learning that now. So, there's always something to learn in miniature painting. It's not just about being better; it's about doing the task in hand to the best of your ability within the time allowed. Maybe something like no, that. that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, let, let let's follow down that rabbit hole for a moment because I've I've watched. This is your. I'm going to say, is it Silver Skulls? Is that right? Is yeah, that right, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Boom. I remembered a Space Marine thing. <laughs> uh, you have to understand, my my personal background is fantasy, like, through and through. Like, for yeah. me, you know, you mentioned seeing the Space Marine and all over. I've said it many times, but for me, seeing uh, the first Skaven miniatures, yeah. Yeah. I was like, this is it. This is my thing. I must be, I must be part of this, right? I'd already been playing a little Warhammer. I had a little empire army that I kind of inherited and cobbled together. Yeah. But as soon as I saw the rats and I actually have uh, your version of uh, Ick at Claw, now the yeah. Arch Warlock up on the screen, um, oh, which I, I did a whole video about, obviously, where I talked about, you know, being able to look at miniatures and really. Uh, so I did a whole hobby cheating where I talked about, you know, being able to see miniatures, not just look at them. And I used this yeah, as an yeah. example um, because it's such a gorgeous, beautiful piece. It's such a beautiful example of one of the best miniatures of that age like that mm. time period where this comes out of i think it's just uh i i don't know who the original sculptor on this was uh, maybe you do i don't know but whoever they are they're one of my heroes in life so there you go so the, the ikit claw you're talking about that was sculpted by seb purvey and the original one was sculpted i think by jez if not by jez it was, it was by one of the perrys uh, gotcha. I think it was uh so forgive me if i'm wrong but yeah the one you're talking about is uh seb purvey he does a lot of the uh yeah, just Sigma range, basically. Yeah. You know, this is the second interview in a row where I've learned that I owe this man so much of the yeah, joy yeah. that's in my life, and I've yeah. never personally thanked him. I'm going to have to make a mission of that next time I'm over at an event because uh, it's it's yeah, this is this is great. It was it was life changing for me to see these little guys. Yeah. Uh. So the, but I, I want to follow this down. You mentioned like setting a, uh. The way I think of it is you set a quality level for yourself yeah. for the Silver Skulls. And I've, I've watched your video on them and how you uh, how you go about painting them. For those who, who uh, for some reason, are watching this and are not aware that Darren has a YouTube channel right now where he has a lot of really great tutorials, what are you doing with your life? Where did you go wrong? I'll, it'll be linked down in the description along <laughs> with everything else, including his blog where he has a lot of great tutorials and you can go there. Uh, how did you... like? How do you navigate that? I, I'd love you to talk about that a little more because I know this is one of the things people often struggle with, right? They feel yeah. like they could paint to a level and they want to paint to a level, but if they do that for the whole army, they'll lose their mind and or never finish yeah. a thing. Exactly. So I just had, it was, okay, so I knew I wanted to play the new 40K, the new 40K being the one that was released a few years ago. Right. Uh, and I knew I wanted a Primara Spaceman army because why wouldn't you? Uh, and then I... I I've got a post on my wall uh, just up there, which is all the Space Marine chapters. Wow, okay. and, uh, and I just looked at that and I went, okay, I need one that, that I can paint quickly, that I don't dislike, maybe one that's got a bit of heritage and a bit of background. And then the, it was going to be the Silver Schools, I think, all the Iron Knights. And I, I know lead belt spray was available. I thought, okay, I can, maybe I can just spray them and then put a wash on and then just pick up the details. So I did a test one and it, and it went really quick. And... And the other thing was there was decals available, those being the Chaos um, Space Marine Iron Warrior decals, because they're right. pretty much the same. So I just, it just sort of fell into place that way. Uh, and then I also looked in the old Rogue Trader, uh, original Warhammer 40,000 rule book, and they were in there as well. So I thought, this is a chapter that's that's existed since day one. Right. But, but I've not really seen a lot of, and what I have seen a lot of hasn't really shown them in the best light, maybe. So I was like, well, maybe you could do something with these. And then uh, even to the point where I contacted uh, the the author of the Silver Schools novel, Sarah Corkwell, she gave me some background and some information on them. 
Um, so she was quite useful as well. So, but yeah, then it was just, uh, so I did a few and then they went really quick. And I do mean to go back to them and do some more tweaks and add some trophies and things on them, but <laughs> there's so much to add anyway. But yeah, it was, right. I tried, I did one, did a recipe. Uh, I always r write down the recipes if I'm doing batch painting like that, which I'll always forget. So recommend doing that. And then, yeah, it just worked out really quickly. And I was just really strict. So normally when you do like a, uh, poor highlights. I just cut it down to two or one, uh, and just just did that, knowing that as it looked okay as a squad, then and they're just going to get pushed around the table, you know. Right. So uh, I didn't, I wasn't too precious with them. Uh, but as an army, they look nice, and and the bases, you know, they they do a lot for them as well as a as an army. So I've seen a lot of armies where the bases can let them down a lot. So if you just, you know, do a nice, neat base, it can make your army look twice as good and, uh, you know, twice as appealing on the battlefield and things as well. So, uh, but yeah, it was, it was a challenge, but yeah, it's because uh, I wanted to play some games and I do enjoy playing games a lot more now, uh, get a bit more time and things. So, but yeah, it was just write down your recipes and be strict. And then you spend your time on your characters and things like I right. did with, uh, with the other guys. But, you know, it's, uh, it's tough. But, and you always feel like, it's that thing is like if you can sprint, why would you walk? It's that it's that mentality with painting. Sometimes it's like, oh, I can paint this better, but I've got to, you know, got to cut it back a bit so that right. it doesn't take so long. Yeah. My elder army, my elder army is, was going to be the one which is like, okay, I'm going to spend a lot of time on this, and it's going nowhere because it's just it takes so long. So I'm like, maybe I should have, you know, gone for something different with those, but. Yeah, it's a challenge with, with painting armies. Anyone that can paint armies, hats off to you. So it's it's a really tough thing to paint full armies to to a decent standard as well. Right, right. Because it's easy to, and and I think that it's easy to get caught up to say, even if you get some initial part done, you know, at the beginning of a project like that, you're real yeah. enthused, you're hyped, you're going, you're spending all this time, you get a squad done or a unit or a character or some mix of that, and then you're like, oh, but now I've got to do the other. Mm -hmm. 1800 points or whatever right and i what i found happens is you start making excuses not to work on that project yeah. right you'll be sitting there on your clean desk you're like okay well I'm, I, I need a new project well i can yeah. do that thing oh that's gonna be a lot of work do i really have the time do i really want to yeah. start one of those and you it's just so easy to make excuses for yourself so by like i think doing what you did there and saying like this is the recipe I use. It's fast. I can execute on it, and I'm yeah. happy with it. And that's the key, right? Like you set well, your your happiness yeah. to that output level. For, for for doing the army to get that done, it was it was that sort of um, so there was work and then reward. So the, the yep. work was uh, a, a ten man squad, and then the reward was I'll do the redemptive dreadnought, and then there was some work again, which was maybe another squad, and then I'd do a character. So there was that. So that really helped. But I'd say what really helped was actually playing some games. So started off with like a thousand points and maybe half of it wasn't painted to begin with. But playing the game made me want to play more and therefore get them painted. So that encouraged me, even though I was painting with unpainted models, which isn't ideal, but it made me want to get them done because I was enjoying playing the game. So Right. It, what made you say, I'm not showing up with these unpainted models again, <laughs> right? Like I'm going to, or next time there'll be less of these on the table. That's right. I'm not. I'm not doing that. Yeah, it's no, it's good motivation. I got to tell you a story. Uh, so I was in Warhammer World um, a couple of years ago, and uh, I was playing a game, uh, and I, I think I had my whole army was just sprayed black. It was a Dark Angels army I had at the time, and I was playing these, a game. These would have been very Dark Angels then if they were just sprayed <laughs> black. Yeah, they were literally just assembled and sprayed black. I'd not painted them yet, sure. and I was playing it, just playing a, like a one-off game against one of the guys in the studio, and his army was painted. And, you know, people that walk around the tables in Warhammer World sure. and they go and they just browse armies and, you know, they'll probably stop you for a chat sort of thing. Uh, so the, this guy was walking around and he stopped at our table and he said to the guy I was playing, he says, oh, nice army, mate, nice army. And uh, and then he looked over at me and looked at my arm and he went, oh, don't worry about it, mate, I can't paint either. <laughs> <laughs> From that day, I promised myself I would never ever turn up to a table with an army like that ever again. That is. This wasn't that long ago either. It was just that, the way he looked at me and then looked down and went, "Yeah, I can't paint either." <laughs> that's amazing. I love everything about that.
I get reminded about it still as well. So it's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you want to talk about motivation. Yes, that's that's good motivation to get going. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I was just slightly embarrassed. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it is the one you're, you're not wrong about Wormworld. Like every time I'm over there, it, you know, one of the things I enjoy the most amongst a lot of great reasons to come visit you all. You all who, you know, live and work in that area, who that is your normal store, the regular place you can go, yeah. the embarrassment of riches that you have of these amazing tables and, yeah. you know, everybody having space to get together. But one of my favorite things to do is just walk around and look at everybody playing games. It's, yeah. it's incredible, uh, yeah. all the stuff that, that, that goes on there. All right. So so that's – I. by the way, one other thing I want to touch on that you made a point of something, and I think it's it's exactly the same thing I do, and I want to just draw it out real fast – which is painting the units is the work and painting the single model that's special or the character is the reward. Yeah. I do the exact same trick. Like I'll yeah. uh, the, I'll, okay, I've got to get this battle line unit done. Fine. I'll get it. And, and you know, you do it to whatever standard you do it to, but then your reward is you get to sit down and like luxuriate in yeah. the single model, right? That's exactly. you're just, you're just yeah. relaxing with it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It's a good trick. It's a super good trick. So for those of you out there, and I mean, I will say this from the perspective of somebody who judges a lot of painting events. When I look at your army, I'm not judging your units or your squads to the same level. I'm judging your characters your or whatever your centerpiece models, right? Like when I yeah, that's it. people will look at things a little bit more. Yeah, exactly. Like that's the, I expect that your characters have a little bit more attention paid and that but your even, um, units some parts of them. So my intercessor squads are all very basic. Uh, and but the if there's a sergeant with a his face exposed, right. that will be painted to, you know, heavy metal sort of level. Because uh, I know people will have a good look at it, and uh, yep. it's it's what stands out in the shot. So even that will be. You know, some parts of the models will be picked out a little bit better than others. But yeah, it's about playing the tricks on the models where you get the most most reward for the time you put in. But yeah, it's just. I think I got lucky with the chapter I picked, really. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, one of my one of my co-workers, Paul Norton, he did a, a silver space green chapter as well. He created his own, and he did his very similar sort of way with a you know spray and a wash, and picking out all of some of the details and things. And his army looks amazing as well. So I've seen a lot of silver metall metallic uh, Primaris armies now. So. It, it has such a wonderful, nice. I mean, the the advantage of it's one of the reasons I actually you know like using true metal paints in uh, for an army. Right. Like mm. because they just have a it has a naturally great look when everything's kind of together there. It has that shine yeah. and everything has these natural reflections. The paint yeah. is doing a lot of work for you. Right? Exactly. Yeah. It's doing it's doing a lot of work for you, which, which is good. So there you go. Just, yeah. Yeah. Right on. All right. So you're you're let's now let's woo, do, 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 do. we recite we, we reset back in time a little bit. You're painting <laughs> along. One of the things that's interesting to me about this, one of the questions I always ask is when did you make the the flip? the switch to start competing and this is interesting because you started working for games workshop at a, you know a relatively quick clip there as it were so did you you know I, obviously you've competed you have you have awards you're you're uh you are a dominant force in the years in like the open category when you're not judging uh where where the gw staff is is able to compete in the in the past years but like how much did competition become a thing for you? Was it just simply the journey toward display and that level of painting for its own right? Was it joining the heavy metal team originally when you did years back? Or like what flipped that switch into a more competition mindset where you really wanted to push, right? It was, so I joined Games Workshop when I was 19. Uh, but a couple of years before that, I entered Golden Demon. Uh, and that's the point where I thought, I thought I was great and I could win the Slayer Sword. And then, you know, like I said, you look back and realize your painting isn't exactly what you thought it was. Right. Uh, so I, I, I think I got like the green sticker, you know, the finalist thing at that time. That was, that was the best I got. And then I joined Games Workshop. And it was only after I joined Games Workshop and, uh, and then, you know, went into the remote team that I feel my painting was at a point where I could possibly win something if I wanted to, if I wanted to try, you know, to, to go down that sort of route. And then very quickly, I got pulled into the Golden Demon judging panel. So for many years, it was sort of off the cards, uh, even to be competitive in my painting. So it was only during the last five years where, I, where we did the smaller Golden Demons, yep. sort of, 
uh, went, okay, I won't judge this one. Maybe I'll enter that one. And uh, and then it was like one of the big old demons. I sort of thought I'd have a year out of judging and I entered that instead. So it's only been a few times that I've entered. But when I did enter, I, you know, I went for it. So I think because it was, um, it's not, there's a certain amount of reputation on the line. You know, if you're going to go from judging to entering, right. it's like I need to make sure that I, I do my best for this and I don't sort of go in half-heartedly. So, uh, yeah, it was just a few times. So there was a Space Marine Golden Demon. There was a World Fantasy Golden Demon, which I entered. There was the main Golden Demon, which I entered twice. Um, so, yeah, so it's only been like a few times. But, yeah, it's fun. It's really fun. So it's sort of like, because it was nice to have this, because I'm always judging. Uh, we can talk about that a bit later as well. But it's nice to be on the other side of the fence, experiencing the competition as the hobbyists and the customers do. So then you can maybe, you know, you get a feel for it a little bit more. So And it's exciting as well. So Absolutely. So one thing <laughs> I want to drill in on there, and this came out of you made a really, really great video that was about uh, – it was sort of like your tips for how to, you know, improve as an artist, as a painter, as a hobbyist, right? And one of the things you had talked about in there, which loops back to what you just said of joining the heavy metal team in the early days there, was form a sort of uh, like a, a, a group, like a mentorship group, right? Yeah. Like a brain trust, I think is the, yeah. is the word you used, um, of people who have a good eye, whose opinion you trust, who are going to be honest with you, right? Mm -hmm. And who can spot and give you feedback on how to take the yeah. next step. My understanding of how the, one of the ways the heavy metal team works, and maybe if I'm, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, but is that like when, when that team is doing work and a single artist is working, those things they're working on will often go around to the other members of the team and they'll often talk to the other members of the team and get feedback and see how to improve. So it's this unbelievably positive feedback, heavy learning environment that I think is just amazing. So yeah, I it. thought we'd drill in on that a little bit. Yeah, that's exactly, it's exactly how it is. So I think uh, you know, the feedback culture thing has, has grown, not just with, you know, within the ML team, but within loads of industry over the last 10 years. I think when I first joined, it was always quite isolated. You just do your work and you finish it and then, you know, you'd hand it over sort of thing. But I think, every, you know, you get constantly asked for feedback, not just within the, within any team you're in, like I'm in the design team, so we do the same thing. Right. Yeah, we do the same thing. But on the internet as well, people, even more so these days, people asking for feedback and feeling like they can ask for feedback, you know, so, and, because that culture's sort of grown now because everybody can contact everybody so you know it's so much easier um you've got to be open to feedback you, you know you even if it's even if you don't want to hear it the, the, the thing is like be open to feedback but don't let it affect you in a negative way and just because they're giving feedback doesn't mean you have to um react to it you can just go okay thanks for feedback and you can literally put it aside and right. you know, some feedback it will not be valid for you or, and and the other thing is um uh, i found really quickly asking for feedback for too many people is very confusing so just we talked about the mastermind group thing and i think that's just it's more about people getting a group of trusted friends that are in you know obviously in, in the hobby they don't have to be in the same town they could you know it could be everywhere but right uh, just just have that group i think and then be honest with each other about getting the feedback because i think people could create more painting groups i think that could be a big win for a lot of people because the heavy metal team um they're great at what they do they're the best at what they do because they're the team you know the right the combined experience and everything together really help and they've got trust in each other so if people can do that i mean there's like computer gaming groups there's groups for everything so uh, I think like people just creating small groups and even give them names and things like that would be a really cool thing to see. Like, um, I know that there's like, you know, the British guys have got a group and there might be a group of Spanish painters that hang out together right. and things like that. But I think more of that sort of thing, if, if you haven't got one, make one, you know, and you'll quickly see <laughs> your painting improve, especially if you've got people in that group that are better than you. So, yeah, I think that's... If you're the best in that group, you need to find a new group. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's like such good advice, having people that you trust who you know are going to give you valuable feedback and who you can go to and have that. And by the way, and you can act the same for them, right? Uh, exactly. 
I, I think that like that kind of rapid feedback just it just you have to uh, accept that what you're putting out is not going to be perfect. But if you yeah. want to take the next step, you've got to you've got to let fresh eyes see it because it's always going to be basically impossible to actually spot, uh, you know, the opportunities in your work yourself with your own eyes. You're too close to it. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. And I mean, the, as a proof point on the, the heavy metal team. Not only like as to how well this culture works, not just look at the incredible, you know, painting that's on the front of every box. I mean, that's just a proof in itself. But, you know, one of the things that I know happens is when they get a big unit that they have to do for a box cover and then they're painting the unit, um, you know, it's not like one person will always handle all of that unit. Sometimes they'll spread that kind of stuff out. Right. And the fact that I could never draw a line and say, oh, this one is this person, and this one is this person, and they're completely consistent, and they're all to a gorgeous high level, tells yeah. you that they've worked together well to actually like bring ever to, to lift all boats, right? Up that's to that it. time. That's it. It's the, the question of style thing. It's just, uh, it's when they finish a project, and when we finish a project, it, it, it should look like it's been painted by one person. Right. You know, that's the ideal thing. And this is the same with like the, the design side of things. Well, uh, uh, yeah, I mean they're just great at that. It's just like they can adapt uh, as much as they want with with those sort of things. So I think, like I said before in in past sort of conversations, like the other metal team's the best it's ever been, and that's the way it should be. The guys uh, the, and the girls there, they're, they're just pushing it uh, beyond any standard that I've seen produce, you know, from the team before, and it's it's just great to see really. And it what that does is. There's a few of us designers that used to be in the Open Metal team, and there's a few of us designers that like to paint. It pushes us to, you know, try and keep up. But obviously, they're doing it all day, every day, so they're going to get better. It's just the way it is. So. Right. So let's talk about that change. That's 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 <coughs> there the next place I want to go on this journey. You were you were with the heavy metal team for a long time. You yeah. were you were painting both for yourself and professionally. What drew you to sculpting? Did you always have, you know, given that artistic background, did you always have an interest in sculpting or, or in design or like what, what sort of tripped you over the line to go, you know what, I think this is something I'd really love to do. Yeah, it was, uh, it seems to be like a natural progression for a lot of painters to start doing some sculpting or, you know, you'll heavily convert models and then you might try sculpting models. But for me, it never been something on, at the front of my mind. It was always, I just loved painting so much and still do. So I think I was eight years into the Evermont team, and at that point I was lead uh, lead painter. So one of the studio managers said, oh, have you ever thought about doing some sculpting? And I was like, I don't feel like I've achieved everything with Evermont yet. I want to do some more there, because at that point we were planning out the color sections for the army books and doing a lot of project planning and things like that, and I felt we were really going somewhere. So, and they were like, oh, okay, cool. And then, you know, t two years later, like another similar conversation was, um, the studio manager at the time, and uh, he's not there anymore. So I'm going to have to mention Ben Fawcett because uh, he was the manager that really gave me the shot. Basically, he he said, "Are you going to have you thought about doing any sculpting?" And I said, uh, "I don't think I can do it." And he said, like, "Just give it a go." So I took two weeks off work, and I copied um, Brian Brian Nelson's Freelance Night from Mordheim. Okay. Yeah. The staff sure. and the hat and the sword. Yeah. When I said copy, I literally got. I, I picked a figure that I loved. I love that figure, and I just took two weeks and I spent two weeks at home just sculpting that figure, trying to copy it. And I took it back in and showed Ben, and he was like, "You know, you see, you can do it." And I was and just finishing that figure was really, you know, gave me a lot of confidence. So, and then uh, really quickly, I found myself over on um, like a trial, three month trial with the designers. Uh, by that team, the design team was a lot smaller. And we were still making uh, physical one-to-one -one miniatures, you know, right. metal and you know, three ups for, for plastic and stuff. And uh, yeah, so that was um, that was like eight years ago now. So you know, things have changed a lot. The design team, we just do you know uh, digital work, plastic miniatures now. So uh, but yeah, so that was my sort of transition. So it wasn't really something that I was, I wasn't really knocking on the door, as it were. It was, it was something that. So he encouraged me to do a little bit. And then I, because I always thought it was this mystical thing I'd never be able to do because it seemed right. really unachievable. And once I did one, I was like, oh, you can actually do this. And it was really cool. And then you start creating your own school. So, um, yeah, so it was something that sort of went into. And then Seb, uh, who I mentioned earlier, he sat with me for three months uh, 
training me basically with how to use green stuff and different putties and things and make armatures and all of that sort of the basic skills from sculpting miniatures and uh, he said because <clears throat> when Seb joined Beginner's Workshop he was he was 18 so he was very young and this when he joined he joined the Ever Metal team and I was in the Ever Metal team okay and I helped him he said I helped him out a lot and he wanted to repay me by helping me because he's such a great sculptor so that was really nice of Seb to sit with me for a while so yeah say so thanks to Seb and Ben really for for my break um, which sort of helped me get where I am now I suppose nice now, have you found that as you've, you, see, you know, you've been there now, you're obviously an experienced sculptor. You guys are working digitally now and such. But have you found that uh, doing the design work has informed your painting in some way as well? Like do the, do, do I, I, this is something I'm super curious about just as a thing, because you are a great painter. You're also a great designer and sculptor of miniatures. How much do you think about painting the miniature? When you're designing it, and how much does design, how much has you know, doing the design informed your painting? You understand? What I mean, like, do they do they look back at each other in any way? Have you found they influence each other? Yeah, yeah, quite heavily. So it's because I, when I'm sculpting miniatures for work, I always think about what surface it is and what color it might be, or uh, you know, what textures it might have, and it does that surface bleed into another surface. Therefore, is that difficult to paint? So. Being a painter, and you, I always say, like, the destiny of the miniatures is to be painted and put on the tabletop. You know, that's, right. that's what we're making them for. And it's only, a, like, a, like, a small amount of us that really take these models and paint them beautifully and, you know, uh, really take them even further, which is great to see. So you have to sort of consider that it's going to be painted and it's going to be seen on the tabletop. And, the, the, yeah, I always keep it in mind, I think. Sometimes when you get when we're giving feedback to some of the other designers, it'll it be I remember it's gonna be painted, so that surface and then they'll go, Oh yeah, yeah, you know. So right. sometimes there's a bit of that, sometimes we can lose sight of it. Um so yeah, I just keep it in mind all the time. And I think it's really important. Really important. Yeah. So yes, basically is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll say that I can feel that because it's one of the things that I very much I, I've always said this, that GW miniatures feel like they were designed by people who paint miniatures, right? Like that's, that's the feeling you get because the surfaces seem delineated, understandable. You get the surface that's crockable. Yeah. So no, it makes complete sense. Yeah. I think it's one of, one of the other designers, Steve, he, he said to me, um, when I first started, he says, you know, it's important to paint your own models. And I was like, well, I've just been looking at this for four weeks. Why would I want to paint it? <laughs> so, but he was like, no, it's important. So it's, I've, now, when I get my models back, I, I try and paint at least one of them. So like, I sculpted this Guitari um, for the Adeptus Mechanicus. Yep. Painted some of those, and I was like, oh, okay, maybe maybe that, that level of detail could be a bit bolder, or maybe next time I should do this. So painting them is a great learning experience for the next project. And then, you know, painted some Gene Stiller cults because we worked on those. So always learning from that as well. So put, like I said with the Golden Demon thing, putting myself in the position of the hobbyist or the customer painting the models that we make is doing the same thing. Right. And it's only going to improve the ones that come afterwards. So, uh, and that's how it should be. You know, they, they should always be getting better. So yeah, well, that's the hope anyways. Absolutely. <coughs> hmm. All right. So then you, you're sculpting and then eventually, like I said, they, they pull you into, into judging. Uh, these are happening around the same time. Hmm. So how have you found it being a judge? And obviously now uh, Max is, is, I understand it's like Max is heading, uh, that up and he's been doing a I will say an absolutely fabulous job uh, and but how have you found judging this like I, I just would love to hear experiences of it because it seems like let me let me let me just talk from the outside here for a moment let me set this up for folks who haven't been there and I'll, I'll use the words like this from an outsider's point of view judging a golden demon you all seem it seems like madness because you are all given, like at Warhammer Fest, let me break down the schedule for folks. So you can enter on Saturday, but I, but, and I, but I would say probably 30% of the entries come in on Saturday, 30 to 40, as it stands right now. Because the old history of it was you had one day. The, the Saturday entry at Warhammer Fest is a more recent addition. So a lot of hobbyists are still stuck in the everything's on one day thing. But it's increasing every year, I think, people showing up on Saturday. So, but the general schedule on Sunday is like 10 a.m., you can show up, you can register, you drop your miniatures in. They You have from 10 a.m. to noon 
to get them in the case. And then you guys are de- you're doing like final your first cuts, I should say. Sorry, you're doing first cuts as they're going in the case, as you're looking this whole time. You're making your first cuts, and then from like noon to I, I think basically like two two thirty is what about the amount of time you have. You have to judge all the categories. There's twelve different distinct categories, right? You've got to set. Yeah. You got to do. You've got to take the first cuts to a second cut to a top three, and then you know then one two three them, and then you've got to decide any commended entries as well. And you have to go all the way around and do that. And then at 3, everything's shut down and everybody thing moves over. And then at 3.30, there's the award ceremony. That is a breakneck pace. And yet, let me be very clear here about this. I have never felt like any of the judges were making wrong calls or rush or anything like that. I want to be 100% sure on that. It amazes me how sharp, how accurate, and how... Like how much of a science you all have judging down to yeah, it just yeah. seems like the most stressful day in the world. So I would just love to hear you talk about your experiences with it. So uh, yeah, so I think it was like three years ago. Golden Demon just seemed to go. You know, the amount of entries, uh, obviously, as the hobby is increased and it's got really popular, which is fantastic for everything. And it was uh, we had one year, and I was normally at the end of Golden Demon, you're on the coach going going back with the rest of the studio guys and everyone's really chatty and you're really pumped about seeing all of the the world's best miniature paint, uh, paintings that you know miniatures up close and um, you just want to go home and do some painting yourself it was like three years ago it was the most stressful <laughs> Golden Demon I've ever had <laughs> so I was I sat on the coach and the guys, well, how was the Golden Demon and I went oh, I'm actually really stressed you know I was very because we had so many entries we didn't you know, we didn't know there was going to be that many that year. And uh, it was just uh, really overwhelming. You know, the cabinets were full and it, it, we got through it. And, you know, the competition was amazing, but it was just, it was a different level. It just seemed to go, just to go up. And not only did the amount of entries go up, the, the standard went up as well, which made the judging even more difficult. Right. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, the, the, we had, uh, Max and I did a seminar at a recent Warhammer World event talking about how to win a golden demon and it was really good actually we got some good questions and things and then we had a similar question are you ever worried that you might miss anything or uh, you know because there's so many entries or because like you said the schedule's so tight and i've been judging golden demon for many many years and just with alan and uh, you know alan merritt who's, who's left now but he was a great sort of judge mentor as it were he was chief judge and what i'm because i was um, uh, lead painter for uh, on my job pretty much and it sounds bad is to spot mistakes yeah, so sure. uh, and as a golden demon judge it, it, although it's a positive experience afterwards you feel pretty bad about yourself because you're trying to find mistakes on the world's best painted miniatures right uh, because what you're doing is you've got a table so you've done the you know you've got the finalists and all of them on the table are all amazing and you're judging for you know gold silver and bronze what you've got to do is move the ones to the side <laughs> that you know aren't going to place. So you're swatting mistakes on them or things that you know are not are not as good as the other things that are on the other miniatures. So you kind of it, it's a it's a negative experience in in that regard, you know, from that point of view. So you're you're really sort of looking for that sort of stuff, but uh, and then you're left with maybe four or five or six models, and then the debate starts with the, the judges about uh, because sometimes you know there is. You know, there, there's a good sort of, well, there's this and there's that. And then if you really like one entry over another, uh, you've got to sort of argue the case for it and point sure. out the things that you don't think are so good on others. And you, you don't want to convince people otherwise. You just want to point out why you like this one more and the reasons for it. Yep. Uh, and so everybody that's on the judging panel, they're all experienced painters. So, <clears throat> And what, it's, what, what people that enter need to know is they all know what they're talking about. And that might sound a bit back coming from me as well, but it's you've got to have trust in the judges. You have to have trust in the judges. So, and when you know, um, which is why we brought in the commended entry cards as well, because we felt that for the amount of entries that that we had now, just saying gold, silver, bronze, you know, one, two, three wasn't enough because there were so many miniatures that were coming so close. And getting that extra, you know, well done, you nearly made it sort of card as well as the the finalist pin. Because the commended entries used to be something years ago in Golden Demon. So I had a chat with Max and we said, we should bring this back. Because uh, then they can be labeled in White Wharf and on the website, it's commended entries right, as well. Right. And it's a, it's a nice little extra thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, like you mentioned, like 
so I used to, Alan left and I took over Golden Demon a bit, but I was like, I'm one man. And uh, it got so big, I was like, and I've got a job to do. I was like, Max, you're the figure painter. <laughs> Can you, <laughs> the other metal guys will look after this? And and uh, Max is way more organized and you know, better than me, that sort of thing. So he's, like you say, he's doing a great job with it. Um, Golden Demon is going from strength to strength, I think. So I'm still judging. I, so I, I took a year out and then I went, oh, can I come back? Because <laughs> I really miss it. So, um, so yeah, I'm doing that. But it's like, just to talk on the experience of it, people always say, well, why don't you enter? You should be entering Golden Demon. So it's like, if you get asked to spend the entire day looking at amazing miniatures, I'm never going to say no. I'd rather do right. that than enter because it's you never get to hold and see that many amazing miniatures up close and and that just makes you a better painter as well so really i'm right you know, I'm, being, I'm being a bit sneaky with it but yeah it's just uh it's amazing i'll never say no to the experience uh yeah it's just fantastic but yeah very stressful it's hard work uh, it's a long day um it's difficult reading social media afterwards as well sometimes you have sure. to say but it's uh i just i just hope people you know re realize that it is it is a tough job and we're always trying to make golden demon better as well so um yeah and, and i'm and i'm really looking forward to golden demon in america this year so absolutely again, hey we're uh, excited again, yeah we're getting coming uh, max and i and a few of the guys coming over for adepticon so that'd be great i'm really looking forward to that and then we've got uk golden demon as well so yeah it's just uh it's only going to get better, I think. But yeah, there's always learning to be had and managing the day. So I think we've got Adepticon planned out really well. We've got a bit more time for that as well. So right. you should feel a bit more relaxed, <laughs> hopefully. Than, <laughs> than, uh, yeah. But yeah, but um, I, lo I love Golden Demon. It's great. And the, the simplicity of Golden Demon is why it's so great, I think. People always, you know, I've had some people say, well, you could do this with it, this with it. And it's all about making it more complex. But Golden Demon is like, you know, the 12, 13 categories and the one, two, three, and you know, it, it's always been that way. And I just, I love that part of the competition as well. It's just, it's just, it's how it is. It's great. Golden yeah, hundred percent. I love it. So it'll be, it's it'll be good to have you over. Like, sorry, I said it'll be good to have you over. Yeah, it'll be great. I've got a, I'm really looking forward to it. No, I've never been before, so I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, it's going to be a great time. You you will love Adepticon. Trust me, it is it is singularly fantastic. Uh, all right, so. Let's talk about just where, like, what right now with your personal miniature painting, like, uh, and, and like, w just where you see yourself at, what's the journey that you find you're on now? Like, what do you want to be doing, exploring in your personal miniature painting hobby? What are the steps you find you're trying to take in day to day right now when you're, you know, when you're sitting down at your desk to paint a miniature, you're not working on a tutorial, it's nothing for work or anything. This is this is you on your journey, right? What do you feel like you're trying to take those steps? So, only only recently, I think is like every time I paint a model, I'll paint I'll paint a model knowing that I'm going to do something new. So, um, so I painted like the Gobba Palooza Goblin yeah, recently yeah. with uh, like you know that's on the mushroom, and I, and I knew I wanted to to paint that because it was going to have new challenging things on it you know like the, the different textures that i was going to try on it and all and i really want to throw a lot of color on a model go full you know full 80s 90s yeah. retro yeah. colorful uh, because it just felt like ages since i opened some colors you know, rather right. than you know just like painting space marines so i was like okay i wanted to get some colors out so there was that so every model i painted was like okay what can i do new on this so it's about not just going through the motions again but more about what's going to challenge me uh, and even at this point with my figure painting, still trying to push myself and learn new things, even if it's a small thing on the model, like I painted the Lucia Vane, uh, and I've not painted that much sheer cloth before, you know, where you can see the yep. skin through the cloth. So I thought I could do that, try that, you know, so that was a new technique. So it's always about trying to find something new as well as painting models I love. But uh, like you said before, like most of my, my time, not most of my time, some of my time is taken up by doing tutorials, which which I love doing as well. I found that I've got a, quite a passion for that as well. So, yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny that now you've circled <laughs> back around. You're getting to use that art education that you were yeah. that you were there. We, we've you've come full circle there, so that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just doing the tutorials is um, it was an accident really because I did a video for Instagram and. I put it on the Instagram TV and then people said, can you put it on YouTube? And I was like, no, no, I just want to put them on here. And then I put one on YouTube and it just, it, you know, it 
spiraled out really and then I did another one and then uh, and it's only now I'm starting to get to grips with it a little bit more but yeah I just uh it's, it's been really great the feedback people have had and it's it's surprising what information's out there I don't know what people are sort of paying for information from painters you know sure and, and that's that's all good and well if information is worth paying for then, then, then that's fantastic but there's a lot of information that can be got for free you know and uh, and i just wanted to go okay this is this is what i know and i'm going to put it here for you guys if you want it and i'm just going to teach you the way i paint you know and uh, and i just i just like it i like doing it. i like doing the videos and getting the feedback is really nice as well and what's really nice is people show me the results that they've had so I get a lot of messages or get you know you get tagged in posts it's like oh, i did this and i used Darren's tutorial and and that's really reward so that's a reward for me you know um i just i just really like it so it's just fun. <laughs> yeah as of we're uh as of our recording of this you're working on a, a sort of paint along series i guess where you're working yeah. on is it the blight lord or the plague lord or one of one yeah. of the nurgle dudes <laughs> this guy the lord of lights yeah there you <laughs> so go that's who he is yeah and uh, so bringing everybody many. along there. Yeah, so uh, that was, I only get like, my tutorials was, like, I don't want to spend too long on it. So it was, I give myself a couple of hours, like on a Thursday evening, just to do something. And then I'll edit it and put it out on the weekend. So that didn't really give me time to paint four models. Uh, I had a lot of people say, oh, we want to see four models. And then I thought, maybe I could do a series. Because people, uh, you know, great painters out there in the world, they do masterclass weekends where you go right. and pay to go and sit with them for a weekend. and. And you learn loads of great stuff and you go away you know but not everyone's got access to that and not everyone maybe can afford that and i thought maybe i could do something similar but through video so and see how it goes if it goes well then maybe i'll do more but really um it was just an ex is this is an experiment so um if i say i'm going to do something i'll do it so this will get finished but we'll see how it goes basically so it's going really well we've uh, had a lot of people posting pictures of their progress and everything so it's just it's nice to get that sort of feeling that everyone's you know joining in and so no i love and, it and it's it's forming that group right there yeah. like we talked about earlier right because instantaneously you're all doing the same thing you're all working together it's like having a spotter when you're working out it's somebody there exactly. who's with you you know to actually get the project and see it through and push yourself to take to not do a shortcut to not give up to put that next layer on whatever it happens to be yeah and the, the style of the, the videos is very different because what i did was i did the video and i put it on put them on youtube it was only after i started putting them on YouTube that I started watching other people's painting tutorials and I was noticed very quickly that their style was very different to the way that I present and um and when I'm painting I'll not just do something I'll give the reason why I'm doing it so right. there's a lot of method there so it's this is the reason I'm moving the brush this way or this is why I'm adding this color and you know and uh, so it's really about I'm not trying to bore people to death which I'm sure it might be doing uh it's about education as well so learning to be a better painter, not just paint it red, paint it blue, paint it green. It's right. The reason we're doing it this way is because of this and because of this. And and really, uh, there might not be um, much to it other than me just paint, teaching people how I paint things. Because I'm sure there's a lot of great painters that might look at it and go, I don't do it that way. Uh, everybody paints differently. Right. And so, uh, yeah, this is just me painting the way that I have always painted. And Basically. No, don't don't feel bad at all. As a, as a fellow long winded presenter who often goes on and rambles too much, trust me, we're we're simpatico on this one. You've got no need to to never change, my friend. Never change. You do it again. Well. I, I, I like watching the other guys as well. I'm like Scott and those guys. They're all really, really entertaining and things. So yeah, mine's all okay, guys. Uh, we're gonna do some painting today. So settle down. <laughs> <laughs> Tuck in. Exactly. <laughs> No entertainment value here. Just sit down and we're going to pay. No, but then, like, I, I'm, I'm really glad that all of that is available because so I like a lot of different styles of teaching. It's yeah. one of the reasons I like, you know, my my YouTube subscriptions are basically, you know, a bunch of people painting miniatures. And it's not like there's just one right way to teach or to entertain. Like, it's great to have all of that and to have all those people out there. The more people sharing information and knowledge. I mean, we live in a golden age, you know, when when you and I were younger and first put paint on a brush, the number of resources available to us was basically maybe your friends that you knew and, and a magazine you could look at and look at finished pictures. But in those magazines, it wasn't like there was really true blow by blow or explanations, which is what you said. Why? Now, 
I mean, it's a golden age for that, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, I've got the heavy metal painting guide on my shelf, and I still look at it every now and then just because I'm getting old. So, uh, but what, what it took me years and years because I, you know, come from a small town and there wasn't anyone to talk to to get feedback, and then the internet didn't exist. So it was like it, I, my learning, you know, curve was very shallow. So it took me a long time to learn things, and it was only when I started interacting with other painters that I got better quite quickly. And nowadays, like you said, people, you know, you've got direct access to the best painters in the world if you want it. And all you've got to do is just, you know, put the hours in. And you can learn so much quicker. I've seen, I've spoke to some painters, how long have you been painting? This is amazing. And they're like, oh, just two years. I'm like, wow, two years. Right. It's, it's, it's great, but it's also, you know, it's not nice for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a little heartbreaking. It's a little heartbreaking. Yeah, absolutely. It's nice, though. It's great. People can just get, you know, go you can go to straight to that person and just ask them how they did things. But. Absolutely. All right. Mm -hmm. So let's speaking of, let's take a look at some of your work. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the picks that uh, Darren sent me. I'll tell you what the, the pick is on about. And then, I just, you know, if you want to share some stories about it, what you like about it, what made, made okay. you want to paint it, just walk us through whatever you find interesting about it. And I'll do some comments. So let's see here. We begin. So everybody should see this on the screen. Now let me make sure he's nice and big enough so everybody can see him. And uh, we're going to start with the Lord Celestant. Uh, so this is your non-metallic explosion, uh, as it were. Uh, this is the, the, the Lord Celestant with the hammer cloak that is just like the richest and most non-metallic gold of non-metallic gold people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think the reason I picked this was because it is the model that put me off painting non-metallic metal ever again. <laughs> <laughs> this is the one that broke you right here. Yep. This, is, this is the one that I was like, yeah, yeah, that's never happening again. So I painted the Sanguinor, you know, every, every, um, I say everybody, most, most people, you know, have seen that, sort of shared it to death everywhere on the internet and shown it everywhere. So, uh, and that was like the start of the non-metallic metal journey for me. And I've painted a lot of non-metallic metal over the years, but it was only, so the Stormcast came out, you know, with a new version of Warhammer, the Age of Sigma. And I knew I wanted to paint one, and uh, I thought I'd look great in non-metallic metal gold. See if I could do it before everybody else does, you know. Sort of. Sure. So, so I started painting this guy. I love the model anyway. And I thought, okay, let's just give it a go. And it took me forever. It took me so long. And I just, you know, got to halfway point. And I thought, I can't give in now because I've spent so many hours on it. I'm going to keep going and keep going. So, yeah, uh, I think... Yeah, it was just one of those models. Like, it's nice to see now, but the only thing I remember is pain. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I just, and I look at it, I can't stare at it for too long. I'm just like, oh, it's so long. And then, uh, but yeah, like, it was a challenge getting, you know, getting the, uh, trying to, it's always a challenge trying to make something look non metallic because you shouldn't, it's a 3D object. It should be in metallic, but we like painting non metallic metal because it's fun and it tricks the eye. And, right. You know, that's why we do it. Uh, and then obviously, you know, there was some different things to try on there with the lightning effect on the hammer. I thought that yep. would be fun. And, you know, the sword and then the base was fun to do as well. So I wanted to make a model because I normally paint models and then just go, oh, I'll just do a quick base. And then everyone always says, oh, you let, let down with the base again. So uh, I thought I'd put a bit of effort into the base on this guy as well. So, and I think it, it, it was just a statement I wanted to make with Age of Sigmar as well to say, you know, this is the sort of, Thing that I want to paint for, for this version of Warhammer as well. So. Right. But yeah, I just, I think it's probably, yeah, it's a turning point for me with, with non metallics. I still do paint non metallics and enjoy it, but I really started warming towards metallic paints a lot more now. You can push a lot of color in there. They done right, they, they can really have a fantastic effect. Um, so I think there's a place for both. But yeah, this was one I think I just wanted to talk about how much I hate painting on <laughs> <laughs> the well, it's a great example of, you know, if it, so, uh, you have a, a great blog entry featuring, featuring the, the miniature you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier about painting non-metallic metal, a resource that I used originally and still will often reference. And this is a great example because you can see where you've pushed the soft and subtle yellows and reds into the mid and low tones, uh, mm -hmm. of the, the metal to keep it really rich and warm. Like it's, it's a thing where uh, you you make this feel very alive through a lot of that glazing at the end, those filters 
that are that are really doing a lot of work as well as the the light pops the white pops the light catches yeah. you know uh, yeah, those things are spots, making it yeah. feel more more active yeah it's like a style thing you know the little the light spots the hot spots uh, i think it was uh during the cool mini or not years there was a lot of non-metallic metal being painted and it was it looked very wooden very brown uh and it was missing those reflection points right so I started doing some metallic metal and started adding those in and doing those glazes and glazing the color in and things. So, which is why it's very rich in color because I painted it and before I glazed all the color on it, it looked wooden. It was just tones of brown. So it was getting those yellow glazes, the orange glazes, and all those warm glazes into it that, that punches the color in and and convinces people that it's that it's not just you know wooden armor. It's you know it's metallic. And then there's those reflection points. You know they. They say, oh, okay, this is shiny. This is, this is but really with non-metallic metal, like in in my blog, I explain how I imagine four points of light around the top of the model. Right. Because as you turn it, you want it to still be convincing as a non-metallic metal piece. So having those four points helps you plot your basic highlights to start with, which then informs the rest. So rather than just making it up, which in some cases you are, um, you've just got to really just give it a convincing finish, you know, having those contrasts of dark next to light, um, all of those things that help uh, trick the eye to thinking something is metallic when it's really not. So. Did you save things like the cloak and his little tabard and like the, the, the hilt and the wraps and the sword? as like when you just couldn't handle the non-metallic anymore did you be like well i'll just go work on this blue cloak for a minute this soft cloth i need to i need to de-stress off the non-metallic i i wonder if you didn't use a similar reward system just with the one mini well normally when i when i paint a model i'll be like okay i'm going to paint the armor and i'll just paint the whole whole of the armor together but with this model i did it a leg and then i did the other leg and then i did the arm and you know i did it in pieces like that right and i didn't normally paint that way but i had to because it was it was just such a, a meal of a, of a miniature so yeah i just i just went through it that way really and gotcha. yeah so it was i'll never i'll never do something like that again in that <laughs> <laughs> well it's a, it's a singular achievement and beautiful and now we've got it and for 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 all of time so there you go yeah, yeah, it's done you only need one <laughs> All right, uh, let's go ahead and there we go. Let's take a look at the next one. So the next one you actually have a whole video uh, about, so people I'll, we, people can reference that. But this is a great miniature. I absolutely love this miniature. I think you sculpted this. Is that right? Uh, which one? Oh, so I'm sorry. This is the Blood Angels Captain that you the, oh, that's yeah. the Primaris Captain, but you've done it that's as right. the Blood Angels yeah. Captain. I apologize. Uh, yeah, so the, I sculpted that one. Uh, yeah, it's obviously sculpted for work. That one, uh, like you say, I did a video on it. It was for my brother for his uh, for his fortieth birthday a couple of years ago. So he collects Blood Angels, and I just I wanted to give him a painted miniature because I'd never painted a miniature for him, and it was really his. You know, the fact that he brought that white dwarf home and invited me into his group of friends to to play games and paint miniatures so it, he's the reason why i'm in this this world that we're in right now uh so i wanted to repay him paint him a model uh and i was, and i wanted to paint that model anyway because like i said earlier you know paint your own sculpts sure also uh, this is like a singularly great space marine sculpt like i'm not saying that just because you're the one who sculpted it <laughs> i would i've said that before this is one i myself painted and have another one of you know ready waiting to paint because i really uh, like it. i find it dynamic and it's a good position on it like it's just yeah, it's fun with, to with, paint yeah the design I, I just wanted a classic pose because we've not had any primaris from what i could see in that classic because i love the old um spaceman captain with the power fist and bolt gun so out right. straight yep. you know the original one that jez sculpted and i thought we need a model like that because you know i know that you know you can go you can do anything you want with, with poses now but i just wanted something that just said you know classic space marine uh, so uh, with the sculpting it was that but with painting i was like okay i'm going to paint dave with blood angel and i wanted to put that john blanche artwork from second edition 140,000 onto the model and just, you know imprint it over the model basically and give it that very retro feel because that was the edition of 140 kid we really played a lot of so i think not only is it a model that i sculpted i painted but it sort of harks back to a time when we had some great memories playing the game um and I think, yeah, just uh, just just painting the model was, like I said, just getting those pots of color out again. So and that was really fun. Um, oh yeah, because that is some bright yellow. That is '90s. <laughs> I would call that '90s yellow, right? Like that is absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's just, I just love love getting those those colors on there. And it's like 
the, the problem is now, uh, obviously, is a there's new painters coming in, and I'm not getting any younger. I, I'll post <laughs> pictures of my miniatures, and they'll be like, "Oh, you're." I love your painting. It's so mo modern and old school at the same time, and I'm not sure if that's a compliment or just just a sign that I'm getting old. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I, think I got a lot of comments like that about this miniature that it, it, it felt old school but still quite modern. I think it's the, a modern technique but with old school uh, feeling to it. Maybe so that's what I was going for. Yeah, but it was just a great great miniature paint, really fun, and then um, it was just a challenge getting all the markings and iconography from off. John's artwork onto the miniature um, as well. So it was just, it was a really nice exercise, I think. So, yeah. And I just um, knew that it was going to be a gift for Dave, really. So. There you go. You know, one of the things you you really uh, are quite uh, good at that's this recognized about your work, much like Gareth, is you're both very clean, sharp, precise painters, right? Yeah. And uh, so I just wonder if you could share. So, like, especially here's one of the things that jumps out at me the cloak of the Primaris captain here. You've done this thin sort of uh, magenta line down into this design, right? Yeah. So when you, and that is a very, very, you know, thin line. <laughs> that is a thin, <laughs> clean, sharp line. Yeah. And yeah. I think that mystifies a lot of people. Like that's something I think a lot of people find challenging in their painting. So yeah. how do you attack something like that? Like what's your method of, of getting to a line like that? For people. Uh, so first of all, I'd, I'd always draw out any. So I, if you've got a cloak or anything, always draw out the design first. That gives you confidence in what you're doing when it actually comes to painting. So I drew out, you know, what I was going to put on the cloak, and then uh, used a very, <laughs> very good brush and uh, always sort of very thinly plot it in with very, you know, thin paint first. Mm -hmm. Don't just go straight on with a bold sort of line first. And with like the design in the corner, so um, what I did was I put plot points on first of where the edges of that design were going to be. So it was like a dot to dot. Right. So I knew that it, you know those those dots were in the right place because obviously you can correct a dot a lot easier than a line. So I just put those dots on and joined it up. So it was like a dot to dot. So that really helps with any freehand work. So. Um, wanted to do a video on that in the future actually so it's just uh yeah so really put the plot points down and then build up um using very you know get it get your confidence in there first by doing a very faint thin line of what it is you want there first right and then we'll look over it but yeah having that steady hand is just something that only comes with time and time and practice but also confidence so you'll find that if you're worried about something or your paintings something you're not sure about it, you'll actually start shaking and wobbling so just going okay i can do this be confident be relaxed and and it will help a lot more so yeah so if the freehand thing and <laughs> being neat has always been sort of like a trademark thing i think for me right um, the big other metal guys where you said say i had a bionic eye because i do loads of tiny, tiny <laughs> things like that. So, uh yeah this is something that, that i really enjoy doing because i saw it as a challenge is can i do this on there you know that kind of thing so right i think one of the most difficult things that I painted was uh, when we painted the space hook set for the box. I painted the librarian, and he had uh, on his shoulder pad he had a, like a a, like a Romanesque style face uh, that I had to paint on the shoulder pad, and that took took a long time. And that was quite quite small in detail, but yeah, it's just uh, I enjoy doing it. It's like the skull on the knee pad as well. That's oh yeah, you know, right, right, absolutely. Fun, hand, but yeah, keeping your paint very thin. And yeah, obviously, I, I, when I was doing that, I made mistakes and went over, so touching back up things as well. So yep. the thing with paint, if you make a mistake, you can always paint over it. So don't stress; it's fine. It's best advice, exactly. We're not uh, we're not doing anything permanent. We're just using paint, exactly right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Uh, all right. So let's uh, take a look at the next one. All right. Next up, we have uh, uh, this is one that I really love. I got to see this one in person because you this was this was one of your open pieces when I was over there for I think one of the AOS days, and this is your Karadran Overlord, uh, little I don't I don't I, uh, Endrin Master. I don't I don't know yeah, which one he is, but yes, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I, just, uh, I remember seeing the because uh, I was obviously I'm a designer when these were being painted, and the F Metal team painted them in the metallic colors, and you know. Uh, and I just thought, what would they look like if they were in the colours that you see classic steam trains in, you know, that, that bottle green and that yeah. rich red 
because I just thought they really suited the aesthetic of the models, the shapes and you know the rivets and the cast iron and things on them. So I wanted to do one in that bottle green color, and I thought, uh, and I love the engine master sculpted by Seb, <laughs> obviously. There you go. Um, He's at Seb it again. Master, there you go. You know, doing his thing. Uh, we call it Age of Seb Mara work. By the way. <laughs> but, uh, so the head is actually a custom sculpted by Seb. Um, so. He sculpted the model and he wanted to do like a, a head which you know exposed the face which you don't normally see in caradron so uh i said to him i said can i please have a copy of that head because i want to put it on this model and you know very graciously let me have one so i painted up the face and things as well but yeah i think that, that like i said earlier doing something different on every model is what i challenge myself with now Right. And on this model, I did the, the texturing effect on the armor. I think that was the main thing. Exactly what I was going to ask you about. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's the thing that uh, a lot of painters, uh, you know, we have fads and crazes and things like that. Paintings like non telemetal OSL. And the texturing thing is something that's been, it's nice to see that's been brought in a little bit more now as well. And it, and it allows you to know, to see the difference between different surfaces more. So when you're painting models, it's... Um, you take a, a like a you go to the next level of painting when you realize that surface is a different material to that surface. Therefore, I must paint that surface, approach it differently to the other surface, rather than just doing it a different color. Right. So cloth next to armor should look differently. You know, should have a different feel, reflect light differently, have a different texture, and that's the sort of thing I wanted to go through with this model as well. So yeah, it's just. I love the model and just getting all of that that texture in and the contrasting tones in the green. So we've got the, the warm tones and the shading with the pitted metal. So I imagine if you're close to that metal, it would be blistered and bubbling and slightly textured and things. Yeah, it's just a, just a really fun fun piece to work on. And once again, getting some colors out. So there you go. Oh, yeah. Well, you've got the bright, like, sort of Escorpina, you know, greens in there uh, and the hammer and his light that's in the middle of his... Uh uh chest plate his eye pieces the the thing on his back G you know nicely balanced around the mini there i love the the oil can with a little drop i understand <laughs> yeah, you added that separately right like that was just a little custom sculpty thing of all that going on there uh, the oil can was off one of the uh one of the vehicle kits i think so one of the, the flying one of the flying kits i think it was just a piece off one of those but yeah like you're talking about color composition so it's something that i because i always plan my work and um, one of the things i'm quite big on so it's about balancing the reds around the model and i thought this guy's got a big hammer which is essentially a tool i thought like you know when you look in a toolbox and you've got the old wrench that's you know that's got you know it's red painted but it's all chipped and sort of thing like right. that so if that's it says a workman's tool so i thought okay he's going to have a red hammer people might think that's a little bit of a joke but it's it works on the model it works with him and it's about being bold with those colors and going now i'm going to give him a massive red hammer <laughs> and it's going to look cool and i'm going to do the red goggles because it's balancing the color around the model and you know and it's all in harmony and your eye sits on the model really nicely and then getting white beard so that the attention goes straight on his face even though he's got all of this color and light bouncing around the model you know you still look at his face straight away which is the most important thing so uh yeah so there you go i'll stop talking <laughs> no it's great i i love this guy i just i think like uh i love the exposed face uh you know hey there's a that sounds like there's a product there uh in alternative <laughs> exposed faces like an exposed face kit pack for uh for for Caradron overlords no it's oh, it's a beautiful you. paint job you did a great job with it i love it thank you yeah i think yeah i took it to the age of sigma golden demon and I, that was nice there for the staff category so all right so next up we have elucia vein uh which uh, I don't know who on the community team put together the uh, original like video reveal for this this thing when when this came out right with her and her crew against the, yeah. the Galar Pox or whatever. Um, but it was like maybe my favorite video that the community has ever done, second yeah. to the Slanesh reveal, which was a religious experience for me. So that's in a different category. But <laughs> the but this was such a like awesome cowboy bebop video and i love this model so take us through why you wanted to paint her and what, what were you doing with her i i think i, I picked this one uh, it's a little bit uh it sounds a bit bad but i sculpted the model so i wanted to paint it and and the uh kill team boat trader was a project that was many years uh in the making 
So it just felt like it was never, ever going to come out. <laughs> and then, and then when, you know, sometimes it goes like that. And then this model, you know, with the rest of her team, eventually made it onto the shelves. And I was like, okay, I really want to paint this model now. Because it had been so long since I made it. And I wanted to put some paint on it and learn from it. And uh, try new things again, like I said, you know, so there's the texturing on the on the skirt. Mm -hmm. I wanted the skirt to have a, like a velvet feel. So that it felt different to the boots, which are very shiny, like the red leather. And then like the sheer cloth, so you can see some of the skin tone showing through the cloth. And then I thought, I, I googled um, Google image some some lace glove images, and they all had the spirals on them, you know, the pattern. Right. So I even thought, can I paint some of that on there? And that'll be a challenge. So I tried to put some of that on there as well. And but the main inspiration behind this was because John John Blanche had done all of the concept art for that project. I really wanted to give it the Blanche colours on it, you know, but still try and retain some of my style. So I had to look at some of his images. I just Googled um, John Blanche artwork, female, and then pulled the colours from those images and then placed them onto the model. And I, I, I gave this miniature to John, um, was it last year for his 70th birthday? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so it was a gift for him. <laughs> and I think the only thing he didn't like was the feather. <laughs> <laughs> Too bright. Yeah. It's too colourful for his uh, for his sort of style with the artwork, I think. But um, I think he said this should be crow's feathers or something black or something like that. But <laughs> I was like, well, you know, I wanted to do bright feathers. So. But yeah, so it was, and we've got the number type metals on there again as well. Mm -hmm. You were back. You you tried yeah. to get out, but it pulled you right <laughs> back in. Yep. Well, this one was because uh, I wanted to uh, photograph it on a very specific background to make right. it feel like it was one of John's pieces of art. So that's why I did it in non-metallics because I wanted it to 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 look like uh, a 2D image in a in a photograph. I think there was a bit of reasoning behind doing the non-metallic metal on this on this lady as well. But yeah, it's just uh, and and again, just paint your own models, um, learn from it, and uh, yeah. So there's a fun one. Uh, I really like the character on the model as well. It just uh, she's cool, and it's just got a nice story behind it uh, from John's concepts to me making it to me painting it and then back to John again. So it was a nice sort of uh, a nice circle trip. of life there. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. So he promised me, he promises me he still got it. So, <laughs> so that's good. Very nice. <laughs> One thing I want to draw everybody's attention to in this is so for people who are looking at this, I'd like to draw everybody's attention to the sword on her like right hip that she's, uh, that she's got her, her hand over there. So it's, she's got this metal, like you, you've done this non-metallic, uh sword or rapier or whatever we want to call it right whatever her her yeah. weapon is there and one of the things i talk about a lot is that when you're doing non-metallics especially silvers but golds as well any any sort of non-metallic reflection is that you shouldn't be afraid to bring some of the light pollution and color of the environment and of the world around into it it'll make it feel more authentic and you can be really expressive in it you know like non-metallic steel isn't just gray and white right it's going to necessarily get polluted by the light around it and you have this red you've worked in where it's picked up the light pollution of her shiny red boot and there's yeah. a little bit of yellow above that where it's picked up the light of the the gold tiger on the bottom of her dress and then the gray where it's and you know what i mean so you've yeah. you've traced these colors throughout where it's finding those reflections i really think that sells yeah it was but it was a fun thing to do it's only something like you said i didn't realize recently is that within the last few years that that's that's what should be happening with the, i don't think if you go if we look at the seller stuff it probably could do with some of that because it seems you know very stark compared to the gold so yeah this is this is a more recent paint job so yeah just keeping that sort of stuff in mind. It's on the skulls as well, on the knee. You can see there's just a little bit of color on the tops of yep. those. And it just pulls it in and makes it feel like it's in harmony with the rest of the model a little bit. So you're really just trying to convince people with any paint job. Um, so uh, it's just trying to do that a little bit more, really. So. And I think just with the, when we see, like, the reality is white, gray, and black paint is sort of the least visually interesting by its nature, right? Um, like, yeah. it's communicating the least visual information. But it can, but it does a lot. Like, obviously, it has this huge value contrast, but it's not communicating much visual information to the eye or to the brain. But when you suddenly put the two together with a little bit of hue in there, yeah. right? Now you've got a lot of work going on. It just feels yeah. so much more vibrant with just a small addition. Exactly. And it's the environment as well. Because so, uh, I knew I, I wanted to photograph her on like a, a very uh, orange sky background, which I, I did do 
some photographs of that as well, which is why I put the warm tones in the, the reflections on the silvers as well at the top, because I knew that this, that's why I wanted the sky to be so. So thinking about the environment of the miniature yoga you know, should be one of the first things you, you think of. So we're painting like the Lord of Lights example uh, that we're doing at the minute. So I'm, I always think that's going to be in a cold, snowy environment. So having that in the back of your mind while you're painting will inform how the model looks. So it was the same with the Lucia as well. It's right. about it's in a desert. You know, the base is in that hot sort of arid sort of landscape. So it's um, having that feeling sort of helps when you're painting it as well. So rather than just colouring in a miniature, which you know, it's all good and well, but setting a miniature in a scene and giving it a feeling is nice if you think about it right at the beginning. Where's this miniature? Where's it going to be? You know. Yep, 100%. Yeah. All right. So, and then next up we have our Shroomancer. We mentioned this guy earlier, uh, yes. Mr. Colorful here. So you kind of talked a little bit about this one, but just kind of take us through the mini and what's your favorite part about it? Because you made some really interesting choices, I think, on this guy. And I, he's just such a fun mini. Yeah, all, so, all the uh, Gava Palooza is super fun, but this guy is exactly, especially fun. Yeah, scared. Guess who? So, there you go. <laughs> of course. So he's at it again. Exactly. Yeah, and I, I, I chat a chat with Seb when I, when I first said, I said, I've got to paint that guy, you know, because I've got the whole set, but I just wanted to paint him. And I wanted to go full. I wanted to open loads of colors. What I did was, I think it was Tom from the Ever Metal team painted the studio version. Okay. And I had a quick look at it, and I was like, that's really nice. And I didn't look at it again until after I finished mine. So I didn't want his color choice, because I knew it would. I didn't want his to influence mine. So I just kept it completely aside, and I just, um, I, I remember seeing it, and I was like, okay, I need to try and forget it now. And I just wanted my colors to be straight out of my head how would I approach it uh, myself I just uh, yeah it's just going for that really bright vibrant um full-on because he's basically he's hallucinating so the whole scene is in his imagination <laughs> uh, right. so I wanted to really push the colors and give it that you know that vibrant sort of um, that feeling you know that, that, that things aren't quite real <laughs> maybe things are a little bit too colorful as it were so which will help reinforce what's going on so yeah, and I just love all the different elements. The model is a mini diorama with, you know, there's a, there's a narrative to the model. He's right. in the mushroom, then he can, then he's seeing things that are going on around him. There's a little mushroom dancing around him with the sticks. You know, he's a little, a little bit scared. And then there's the big bat mushroom that's going to attack him. And then even his staff's coming to life on one side. Right, so, right. you know, getting the color on the side of the, you know, the, the, the staff, the moon head. So one's still solid, one's. You know, coming to life and sort of maybe talking to him and laughing. So I put a bit of colour into that to make it feel like that side was you know, slightly living. And then then I picked some of the little um, the little creatures and little critters and things and put some of those on the base as well just to set the scene a little bit more. It's like, you know, like I said earlier, most of the time I rush my bases, but with this one I thought I put a bit of effort into it. The miniature took a long time. So And I've still got this miniature, I still own it because... The same with the carriage one as well. I mean, I, I give a lot of my miniatures away uh, as gifts, but I kept these, kept those last two because they, I think they just took so long I couldn't, I couldn't sure. give them away. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, just like it's just playing with the different textures. Like, I think the brain texture, like on the uh, on the the mushroom spider thing, yeah. if they want to do that, that was quite fun to do. That's got like a. I looked at. I even looked at images of brains, and they've got like you know they've got that sort of um, mottled, spotty texture and quite wet. So I gave it that sort of slimy sort of texture that you, that you might get. So you know, it's just, you know, it's just really colorful and really fun. And the, the hardest thing with this model was to balance out all of the colors and make it feel in harmony. So I think I've tackled that by having a lot of blues and purples around the model, which pulled it together. So there's blues in the goblin uh, around the toes and things. Yeah, and... I was going to mention that. I love that you. I love <laughs> that you called it out because it's one of the things that I, I noticed almost immediately is how well you've smoothed the blue throughout by adding it as a, a low shadow tone. He's also got very warm highlights, so it works yeah. particularly well to have that nice cold shadow. But it balances the mushroom above his head, the two heads of the dancing guys around him. There's also exactly. some very soft blue tones down in the. Uh, sort of base of the you know spider mushroom as well so yeah it's just really nice yeah just just keep keeping it or you know so it's like if you can have if you've got blue in something on the model put it somewhere else and it'll just hang the model together really well i mean it's something that we're teaching in the in the i keep talking about this masterclass we're working on but it's a good example it's like 
if you've got warm tones in the skin, put those warm tones in the shading on the armor so the armor doesn't feel so separate to the skin. You know, you want the model to have a nice sort of feeling that it's not disparate or anything, that it's sitting together really well. So and because this model was so colorful, it could have felt really jarring and separate, but having those tones throughout the model really helped make it feel in harmony. Yeah, he's great. I, I I think my favorite part of this one is just in general of the the miniature that I thought you brought it really well is the face coming alive on his staff. It reminds me of like um, Jacob Marley coming alive as the door knocker in you know uh, in a Christmas Carol or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And I love that you turned that into flesh tone. But there's another subtle thing that's happening there is it's actually I think weakening the yellow on the side near him. So it's not so much yellow up there, right? Because the flesh tone is much more soft, much more neutral. So it's mm -hmm. doing sort of double duty in both telling a story and compositionally it's balancing the piece, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a cool model. I love painting that. That was great. It was really fun. It was going to be for a uh, golden demon entry, but um, yeah, ended up judging. I was, the original plan was to paint all of them and do them all on a big display base. But this one took so long. I was like, yeah, I'm done now. <laughs> are, are, how often are our original plans not exactly where we end up? Yes, indeed. Uh, I had it in my mind and everything. They were going to sort of stack up to him at the top and all the other guys around him. And it was going to go full on 80s uh, Warhammer celebration, mushrooms, you know, the lot. And yeah, so I just finished the one model and moved on to the next project. <laughs> hey, look, there's no reason you couldn't slowly do it over time and eventually build yourself into it. You know, the future is the future's not written yet. There you go. <laughs> okay, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So lastly, here we have our Space Wolf uh, brothers uh, with our our uh, our fallen rubric marine down on the ground. Um so, so talk to me about my least favorite chapter of uh, of Space Marines. Go ahead. Okay, sorry, it's time for me to <laughs> <laughs> No, like the Space Wolves brothers are going to come after me and in hordes for that. But you have to understand, I was playing 40k back in third edition, and I was playing yeah. Imperial Guard. Okay. And, you know, we were lucky if we got, like, a slightly strong laser gun. And here would come the Space Wolves who were, like, one-handing, full-on bolters and just, you know, doing everything. And I was like, these guys are just cheaters. And so, you know, <laughs> as a young man, my biases were set. But, yeah. Yeah, I remember, I, the first time I came across Space Wolves, my brother started collecting them when they first came out in, like, 94. Yeah. And, uh, they, they were the first ones to get the new Codex. And I was just, I love Space Wolves. These are great, so... But yeah, I remember all of all of that. Uh, by um, space was my favorite chapter. So, uh, and and if there's any that ever need sculpting, I'm always the first to put my hand up. Like I always say. But the story behind this was uh, so we were talked about earlier about entering Golden Demon. So this was one of the times I did enter Golden Demon, and this was the first time I think I entered the main Golden Demon, and it was the first time I met a painter called Max Fillet. <laughs> so, do you? Uh, so you you've obviously heard of Max. He's on the elemental team now but then he wasn't on the elemental team uh he was entering golden demon <laughs> so ah. he, he decided to and oh he was actually uh in go in games workshop so he was a staff member in um the retail store i think at the time okay so uh so sh long story short he entered golden demon with a, with a dire armor with some skaven and i entered into the open competition with with this mini dire armor vignette and max got gold and i got silver and uh and i was confident that i was gonna do well like you know because i was like okay this is the first time i'm gonna enter i put a lot of time into this and i and i came second and it was a great reminder that you know you need to always keep trying and keep pushing because i'm right. um, although getting silver in the open competition is fantastic yes you know and, and you've got to be happy with that but it was it was Having Max, who's you know younger than me, and he was very fresh to the scene then as well. I think for for me, it was like, okay, I need to book my ideas up a little bit and push myself, and you know, make myself aware that you know that there's there's people out there that are always going to be better than you. So, it, and and whilst I love the piece, and uh, I'm looking at it now, and I could change this or change that, I don't think there's a lot that I could have done to have to have beaten Max that year anyway, because his piece was really great. So, and that was the year that I dropped out judging. And then came back again the year after, maybe because I was a bit sore. <laughs> ah, there you go. There you go. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the the Golden Demon, uh, the, the second place for that. But yeah, it was just it was just a nice story, just to um, 
So rather than just saying like, yeah, I got gold, it's like, no, I, I didn't get what I wanted that year. Obviously, everybody wants gold, everyone wants to get the best, but it was just a, a nice uh, a nice reminder for me that you keep trying, keep pushing, even though you think you're at a place that, you know, you, right. which is why the Blood Angel captain that we looked at earlier, that was the one I entered second time and I got gold with that, which was, you know, and I think, you, personally, I think the Blood Angel captain is better as a piece and I pushed myself on that, which is why it, it maybe did better. So you need those reminders to, you know, to keep pushing you, even if you think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm in the best place I'm going to be with paintings. There's always someone out there that's better than you. You've got to keep painting. You've got to be, keep putting the hours in. So, yep. And this piece reminded me of that. So I think it's, uh, it's an important piece for me to look at every now and then just to say, yep, no, keep going. So Nice. I, I think I know exactly. I'll, <coughs> I'll minimize this down and we'll be looking at you again. I think I know exactly the piece you're talking about. That was the one that Max did with the two Skaven, like Eshin uh, gutter runners. And he had crafted yeah. the sewer scene and made the, the ladder or whatever, like out of, I think he's like paper clips and some stuff and fashioned it yeah. all together. Yeah. yeah. It's great. That definitely deserved a deserved win as well. So, I mean, I had a, had a chat with the judges afterwards and uh, they were like, yeah, it was a split decision, but yeah, I was like, ah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> go but, Max. Max deserves it. Max deserves it. And I wouldn't have it any other way. So, uh, like I say, you need things like that to, to ground you and, and keep you focused on trying to get better. So. All right. Are you ready for some lightning round questions here so we can so we close out? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Here we go. First lightning round question. Who is your favorite current miniature painter? And you're only allowed to pick one because we could all give 50. There's, there's a, there, the world is full of amazing artists, but if you had to pick one. Does it have to be current? Uh, no, current or past. I'm sorry. Yes, it can okay. be some from the, from somebody from the past. Yeah. Okay, it's going to be Mike McVeigh. I had a feeling that's where you were. As soon as you said past, I, I heard Mike McVeigh coming. For those who might not know, can you explain uh, Mike McVeigh to folks? Uh, Mike McVeigh is basically, he's like the original face of the Evermetal team. He did the painting guides for Evermetal back in the 80s, 90s. And sort of champion the Evermetal style, he led the Evermetal team, did some of the large dioramas that I'm sure you've seen, the Horus versus Emperor diorama. He's he's a legend, basically. He's the reason why I'm, I'm doing this and why a lot of painters are doing this. Uh, and I don't think he gets mentioned enough these days. Uh, and, and it wouldn't be fair to me to mention anybody else other than him, especially considering if I'm judging on Demon and I say anybody else's name. <laughs> so, Perfectly fine. And, and I am 100% accepting of that answer. For, for Just because for those who don't, you know, who might be newer, they might not even be familiar with Mike's work. And it's so incredible. I think people don't understand just how influential it was yeah, in that amazing. time period. Because again, yeah. there wasn't a hundred different sources. We didn't get to see a hundred miniature painters. Most of us yeah. couldn't travel to conventions. There wasn't these videos. There wasn't Facebook where you were looking at the photos from the big, uh, you know, from the big miniature painting competitions. Yeah. But Mike's work was so singularly impactful. Right. Exactly. That's what I remember. The importance of having a mentor, and Mike was my mentor. When I say that, I don't mean, I mean, I've only ever met him a few times and had a few conversations with him. We spoke mostly over the internet, uh, but he was my mentor in terms of the access, what I had access to, the same as you, really. So, yeah, he, if people don't know his work, just start looking, looking at his work. Um, you'll be able to find it out there. It's, uh, which is why I still paint the way I do. I think it's just that style comes from his teaching and it's ingrained within me now so yeah it is. no it's a it's a great pick hmm. all right what is your favorite color of paint again if you have to pick one your favorite color okay so it's just red so uh if i have to pick a pop color it's mephiston red i think oh wow that's very specific okay yeah there, a lot of people really hem and haul over this you're just like bam red all right yeah, red. Uh, like i said like years ago we um, I, myself and Dave Cross, we, uh, Dave Cross from Games Workshop, uh, he's head of the hobby project, uh, products team. Mm -hmm. uh, we redeveloped the paint range uh, the, into what the new paint range is now. And one of my main things was, okay, I've got to get a really nice red. So we worked really hard. We worked really hard on the whole paint range, but I just, because I love red, it's my favorite color. I was like, need a decent red, got to have a good red that goes over black. So that's Mephiston red, so it's my favorite color. So. Do you like the new contrast reds as well? 
Yeah, I love the new contrast. Uh, I, I've been playing a lot with the contrast paints now. I've not been using them the way that they've been intended, which might be a bit naughty. I've been using them as glazes. Oh, same uh, here. I actually love them as glazes. They work. Yeah, I think uh, I'm probably going to look forward to doing a video about you know, different ways to use contrast paints because they're great for beginners to get their armies painted, which is what they're for, but they're a really great tool for experienced painters to really go back and, and relearn some techniques which might have dropped out over time because the tools haven't been there. But now these contrast paints are back. It's really exciting again. So. Yeah, see, for me, uh, being the imperial fists if i if th those that's my that's my you know space space marine chapter that yand in yellow um yeah. i think it's just such a good yellow i use it all the time it's just like a little pop glaze to punch in color to things because it's really really rich it's great yeah. yeah just having that choice at the end of painting you painted a piece of a model and you're like oh, it's it's great it's well blended and i'm happy but it's just the wrong tone being able to just put a glaze on it and change it completely with one coat is uh you know, it's, it's really cool. So those contrast paints are, are really great for that. All right. Right on. Final question. You can construe the word type in any way you'd like, yeah. but what is your favorite type of miniatures to paint? You could say whatever you want, whatever you see the word type meaning here. What's your favorite type of minis to paint? Uh, probably be more specific again. It's, it's the miniature that I painted the most of, so it's Space Marine. I think it's, it's the reason why, what drew me into it even more than ever before. So it's the the humble or not so humble Space Marine. I think I love painting Space Marines. So. There's something about them that just keeps me going back to painting more. So how many, how many Space Marine legs at this point do you have? <laughs> just a collection of Space Marine legs. <laughs> I've got a few going on now. Yeah, I've painted more than just legs, but yeah, with, uh, with the videos, that's, that's all I can do in the time I've got. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's also a great, like, it's a, it's a really good shape, and it has good volumes, and it shows well on camera, so I get it. It's just funny, because I, I think if you're, you must have, like, that workspace, because I have some stuff like this, too, of just miniatures I've used for, for yeah. tutorials and stuff, where they're kind of half-finished, and they just sit there, and it's like, you're, the, the leg is a frequent thing you've used. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I just love paints, but okay, because there's so many types of Space Marines, and you can give them a history and a background. And there's, I mean, I've painted so many different over the years and I never get bored of them because they're just, there is fun. You can do a tactical Marine or you can do a chapter master and you, you can make them as exciting and, you know, as you want to be really. So you can just have a lot and you can paint them any color you want. You can just have some fun. So yeah. And, Absolutely. And the best miniature to learn how to paint on as well. So I always say to people, like, how do you paint neat? Just paint space marines for sure. a long time and you'll you'll gain that brush control that eye hand coordination and once you get that you can paint anything as long as someone tells you the information you need with colors and things if you can put your brush in the right place you're you're, you're set you're on the way so I, i've always thought the same about the the redesign for the new for the stormcast eternals right especially the original ones like the liberators and you know those th the, the sort of generation one stormcast of the main chamber yeah. because they have a they have a lot of the same feeling shapes and volumes they have these very nice segments and so like i i, I think that both of those things both those miniatures to me have always felt like like space marines on one side and the stormcast on the other they just feel like great miniatures because they can make build a new painter's confidence and skill but they can also be a nice palette with just they have a lot of just negative space that you can explore as you continue to grow in your journey right which is exactly. nice yeah. yeah i'm sure i'll many more as well so that's it's a space marine <laughs> not the most exciting answer in the world but there you go it is <laughs> a truth. perfectly fine answer that's absolutely <laughs> great all right sir well thank you very much this has been absolutely wonderful uh as i said uh, his blog is down below. The YouTube channel is down below. Subscribe, follow, do all that stuff. He's got a bunch of great tutorials out there in both word and visual form now. So, Darren, I just want to say thank you very much, sir. Yes, Vince. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Absolutely. For all of you out there who are watching, thank you so much for watching. I very much appreciate it. And as always, we'll see you next time.